Grace is shown to the undeserving. Mercy is compassion to the miserable. Therefore, the synonym for mercy is compassion. Blessed are those who are compassionate, for they will be shown compassion. Larry Richard says that in the original language, it expressed only the emotion that was aroused by contact with a person who was suffering. That's what, that's long time ago. The, the term in the, in the beginnings, it was just, you know, somebody just felt the feelings of, oh my, and it basically it was like pity. Now think about that. How many of you love to be pitied? I'm not seeing anybody raise their hand with excitement and enthusiasm there. <laughs> pity. You really don't want, because pity, just, it just doesn't feel right, does it? You're like, oh, I'm pitying you. Like, and, and you're so much better than I am. You know, pity is just an, an uncomfortable thing. And that's where the original word started, with just the feelings of, you know, oh, it's so sad that you're like that. It almost sounds, doesn't it, like the... The, the publican and the Pharisee, and the Pharisee's standing there, and the publican's over here, and he's like, oh, he's a, a terrible sinner. And you're like, oh God, oh God, I can't even talk to you. I know I, I, know I should be here. Then the publican's over there, and I'm oh, pity him. <laughs> Glad I'm not like him. Thank you, Jesus. Now God bless me. <laughs> and, and, and that's kind of the way pity comes off. But see, compassion and compassion, mercy is this emotion, this feeling that, okay, I, you feel for somebody but then you do something about it. It may be that when you drive off the freeway and you see the sign there and they're, they're holding up this one yesterday, I couldn't even read it. It, it was like this long and the words were this big. And I could read, I know you had some long message there, but the key is instead of looking away, oh, I don't want to look because if I look, then they're going to want money. But look them in the eye and smile. Hi. You don't have to give money to show respect, to show honor, to show value to somebody. Our Mountain Help Ministry has really been working and trying to learn how to care about people without creating dependency. We've tried to learn how do we come alongside of people and show them the respect that they deserve, yet if they need something, help them get that need met. And oftentimes that means we're going to work with them rather than say, oh, here, let me just give you this. Goodbye. In fact, it's the one thing that I got to confess to you that's bothering me now about our every other week food distribution. Our, our food distribution, we'll have, we gave away 200 boxes this last week. 40 pound boxes with vegetables and dairy products in them. And it bothers me that the people are lined up and they just kind of come through and we're just, you know, here's the box. How many families do you want to, are you taking this to? Okay, and then we're putting the boxes in there and it's goodbye. And some of the people out there don't know Christ that are even volunteering, so they're not gonna say God bless you even. And so it's like, we're, and Judy and I have talked a lot about this, uh, Judy Easton, our director, our minister of outreach director of Mountain Health, that we're not making that personal connection to people in that long line. We have three or four people that walk up, and when they walk up, we get to have a little bit more of a conversation with them. But other than that, we're not getting that real connection. And for us, that feels like failure. Because you have to really connect to people to show that you care about them. And compassion does that. Mercy does that. Mercy connects to an individual with feeling and with action. William Barclay said that the, the Hebrew word, or and some of you have probably heard this, chesed, that's the word that's, that's translated many places, loving kindness. It's the same root word for mercy or being merciful. And it has the idea of the ability to get right inside the other person's skin until we can see things with his eyes, think things with his mind, and feel things with with his feelings. Now, how many of you have gotten that close to somebody? Where you see what they see, think what they think, feel what they feel, because the merciful are able to make that kind of deeper connection. Notice you can't do that just, you know, hi, bye. 
It takes more, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. In fact, having a feeling of sorrow over someone's bad situation, I now want to try to do something about it, Barclay said. Mercy is more than a feeling, but not less than that. Mercy begins with simple recognition that someone is hurting around you. But mere seeing or feeling isn't mercy. Mercy moves from feeling to action. It is active compassion for those in need. Ray Pritchard said, there's like three steps. I see the need, that's recognition, right? Secondly, I am moved by the need, that's motivation, feeling. But thirdly, I move to meet the need, and that's action. Well, I said we're gonna to try to understand a little bit of this variation between mercy. Mercy differs from grace. Psalm 4.1 says this, for the director of music with stringed instruments, a psalm of David, answer me when I call to you, my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. Do you hear? He, David's actually saying, okay, God, I want you to feel what I'm feeling. I want you to get concerned about what I'm feeling. And then I want you to do something about it. I want action. Psalm 6.2 has a similar concept. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I am faint. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are in agony. Even David, as he's writing this, is saying, oh man, I'm hurting. I'm about to pass out, I'm faint. And my bones are in pain, God. I've got arthritis or who knows what else. He's causing him these, pain, these feelings. He says, I'm feeling this, God. And mercy says, God, I want you to do something about that. I want you to meet my The two terms, grace in the New Testament is the word charis, charis. It's the root word for charismatic, charismaton, charis, charismatic, charis, the gifts of God. Grace is God's free gift that gives us forgiveness. Whereas mercy, is the gift that God gives to alleviate the consequences of our sin. You hear the difference? Grace says, okay, here's a free gift. You don't deserve this. You're rotten, you're a sinner, you're messed up, but I'm going to give you a gift, and that gift is forgiveness. And it comes to you unmerited, unearned, nothing you can do to deserve it. In fact, you shouldn't have it except God chooses to give it to us. That's grace. That's a gift. Mercy, God then says, and I'm going to show you mercy that instead of giving you the consequences for your sin, even though I've forgiven you, there's still consequences, right? If you choose to jump off the roof out here, uh, you can't ask God for forgiveness on the way down and think that you're not going to hurt once you hit the pavement. Okay? It, but, but mercy says, I'm going to actually take away the consequence of your sin. I, I like the way Lee Strobel said it and many others. They say, grace is getting what you don't deserve. Mm -hmm. That's salvation. Justice is getting what you do deserve. <laughs> That's punishment. And mercy is not getting what you deserve. That's getting no punishment. We deserve punishment. For our sins. I know, I, I, maybe y'all do, but I've got sin I deserve punishment for. And yet mercy says, because God's already forgiven me, God's given me his grace. Justice says, Jesus paid the price for your sin. And therefore, by his mercy, he takes away the consequences. Let me give you some other, maybe back and forth comparison of grace and mercy. Grace is God's solution to man's sin. Mercy is God's solution to our misery. Grace covers the sin, whereas mercy actually removes the pain. Grace gives us what we do not deserve. Mercy does not give us what we do deserve, as I mentioned earlier. Grace is that unearned favor, a gift from God that saves us. 
Mercy is that undeserved favor that forgives us. Grace deals with the cause of sin. Mercy deals with the symptoms. Grace pardons, offers pardon for the crime. Mercy offers relief from the punishment. Grace cures or heals the disease. Mercy eliminates the pain of the disease. Grace re regards salvation. It says, heaven. Mercy says, no hell. Grace says, I pardon you. Mercy says, I pity you. In the best sense of that term. <clears throat> Matthew 9, when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Luke, in Luke 10, Jesus said, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man? This is the story of the, the Good Samaritan, right? And you have the two religious leaders and you have the Samaritan. And they're all going down the same road. And they all see the same naked man laying there on the ground. And they know he's a Jew. There's ways to know that. And, they, and he's got nothing there with him. And two of them walk by and one stops. And it's the Samaritan that stops. And Jesus is speaking to a Pharisee. And he says to that Pharisee, okay, so which one of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hand of the robbers? And the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Can you imagine those first two guys walking by? They're walking by, they've been heading up to Jerusalem, so they got to keep themselves clean. And it's like, I mean, they may have even known the guy. You know, oh, look, it's George. What a shame. Stole everything from him. Naked too. Feel bad for you, George. This really hurt. Hope somebody can help you. God bless you. And they walk on by. But the Samaritan is the one who Jesus points out, who actually, he gets the religious guy, right? The, the teacher of the law, he gets him to declare it. Which one, shh, which one was the neighbor? Uh, the one who stopped and what? Showed mercy. What did he do? Picks him up, puts him on his own donkey, takes him to an inn, bandage, cleans up his wounds, takes care of him there, leaves money for the man to be taken care of even when he's not there. Which one was the neighbor? The man who showed mercy. <coughs> In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 says, Therefore let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Folks, we need grace and mercy, don't we? Yes. We need them both. We need the gift yes. that we can't earn and we need the compassion of God to take away the pain. So the simple question this morning, what can we do to show mercy? <clears throat> to people around us. And notice, it's not good enough just to feel pity for somebody, is it? But we've got to put up action to our feelings. I like what First Peter said, finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this one you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. What's he describing? What we should be doing in order to show mercy is we should be blessing people. First John 3, 17 gets even more specific. If anyone has material possessions, do any of you have material possessions? <laughs> hmm, some of you are afraid to answer. Yeah. Yes or no? Do any yeah. of you have material possessions? Yes. yes. Way too many. Okay. Do some of you not have material possessions? 
Because if you don't, then we're all going to have to do something about that this morning. Uh, if anyone has material possessions, again, just so you know, this is 1 John 3, 17 and 18, and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, now, 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 let's just pause there for a second. Okay, so you should have pity. Oh, that's easy, right? Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, things are so bad for you. I really feel it here. It really bothers me. In fact, you know, I may even start to cry for you. God bless you. But John says, uh, hold on. Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. See, mercy doesn't stop with just the feeling. It moves into the action. James said it this way, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, that's kind of like the pity part, right? But does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Alexander McLaren preached on this text. When he finished his message, he closed by challenging his congregation to move among men as copies of God. God's called us to be his presence, to be his servants, to be out in the community, in the world, being his him for the people we come in contact with. Copies of God. Chrysostom said, mercy imitates God and disappoints Satan. How can we do this? Well, I'll give you just three. Number one, give. Give what you have to the Lord and to others, to people in need. Number two, pray. Maybe I should have put that first. It is the most important thing. I'm just convinced of this. The most important thing we can do for one another is pray for one another. Now, it may be that we, like Spurgeon, learn something when we're praying. And so I love the story of Spurgeon. He, he and some friends of his found out that there was a widow that had no food. And so they decided they were going to go pray with that widow and meet her at, the, at her house, take care of her. Well, the guys are, his, Spurgeon's friends are outside there waiting for him to come and to come and he doesn't come. And finally they go in, they knock on the door and they go in and, and they say, you know, we had hoped to wait for Spurgeon, but he didn't hear. Uh, oh, and there's a plate of food on the table, fruit and other things. And it's a note and a note with it that says, here's my prayer. <laughs> so instead of just praying, Spurgeon had prayed that she needs food and it sent the food over for her. That was his prayer. We need to put action to our praying. Even. But I'm telling you folks, we got to do more praying for one another. Face to face, on the phone, do it on Zoom, whatever. Don't let the medium hinder it, okay? But we've got to be praying for one another. And, and if you have the time, and it'd be a little bit challenging, wouldn't it, to get to the end of the freeway, and somebody's standing there with their sign. Now, can you pray for them as you're going by? Surely you could do that, right? Well, here's a novel approach. I'm, I'm, okay, don't listen if you don't want to feel guilty when you get to the end of the freeway, okay? <laughs> Plug your ears, okay? When you get to the end of the freeway, turn the corner, park in the gas station, walk over there and say, hello, tell them your name, and then say, you know, I, I, I see your sign. Would you mind if I prayed for you? Now, if God then, when you're praying, tells you to do something else for them, then do it. But I wonder how many people stop and pray with the people at the end of the freeway. Mm -hmm. hmm. Again, please don't stop your car at the end of the freeway and get out. Okay? No, I'm not suggesting that you make a traffic jam. <laughs> but, but it's just... We need to put prayer into a practical realm in which we do this with people anywhere we're at without any hesitation, without limitation. We need to be praying for people. And then the third thing we can do, so give, pray, and the third thing you can do practically is forgive. 
Sometimes you need to start by forgiving yourself. You may need to forgive a spouse or another family member. You may need to forgive a neighbor or a coworker, or you just remember somebody that you're still ticked off from 89 years ago. I, that's you, because you're the only one that reached that age yet, right? It's been 89 years ago that you got ticked off at that person, and you suddenly remembered, I never forgave that person. And you need to go back and somehow say, okay, I'm going to forgive that person. Give, pray, forgive. There are practical things we can do to show mercy to people. Sometimes, folks, it can be hard to be merciful. To be merciful. I think it's maybe especially hard when you're in pain. When you're hurting. When you're upset. When you're sick. When you're frustrated. When you're already in a bad place. It can be hard to be merciful. But I would dare say this. That when you're in that bad place, you may also be at the best place to be merciful. Because you, in pain, understand when someone else might be in pain too. Instead of just being nonchalant, you know, oh, you're hurting? Oh, that's too bad. But, you know, oh, you hurt? Oh, in your back too? Oh, it makes you stupid? Oh, it, you get jolts in your, oh. And you, if you can understand the pain of someone else because of the pain you're going through. Folks, I think David changed as a worship leader because of his sin with Bathsheba. And when Nathan came to him and said, David, there's this man. He had a whole bunch of sheep and, and then there's a guy who had one and the guy with a whole bunch of them took the one little lamb that this one poor man had. And David starts to get ticked off. See, see Nathan knew how to get him to feel the right feelings, right? He starts getting ticked off and upset. And I'm going to get that guy. Tell me who it is. I can take him out right now. I'm the king. He says, good, you're the man. And when it hit home that he was the man, now David had to face his sin. And so we have passages like Psalm 32 and Psalm 51, where David starts to pour out his heart and realize his sin. And folks, it changed him. As a man, as a king. So when his son later is going to take the throne away from him, instead of him just attacking his son, what does he do? He leaves. You see, David has come to understand what it means to be merciful, to be compassionate, to be kind and loving, because he's experienced that from God. And even his sin, his influence. And it's Joseph, isn't it? It's Joseph sold into slavery. And folks, you know, don't over glorify Joseph. The kid, as a young kid, was, he was so, he was so into himself that when he had a dream, he went in and told, hey guys, guess what? You are going to be bowing down to me someday. Isn't that wonderful? How stupid can you be when you're the youngest? You're already the favorite son of dad anyways. You already got this coat that shows off who you are and how special you are and that you're more important than all the rest of them. And you say, and guess what? You know, I got another dream. And not only you, but dad's going to bow down too. It's going to be really, really great. You know, it, David deserved to get a little bit of reaction from his brothers that was not very nice. And he gets sold into slavery and he's down there in slavery and, and you know the story and God does an incredible thing and, 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 and Joseph is going to take his whole family here and down there eventually. But don't forget that part of the story where Joseph's brothers come. Is it just after dad's died? And they send this note, this letter. Um, this is from Dad. Dad said you're supposed to forgive us, you know, because... Uh, and he's like, what in the world? And, and then Scripture says, Genesis 50, that Joseph starts to weep. Why in the world does he weep? His brothers don't understand he's already forgiven them. And he, and he calls them in and he says, you guys, I would never hurt you. What happened to me was from God himself. What was meant for evil, and, and I know you guys wanted to take my life. Yeah, in fact, I'm, I'm thankful that you actually sold me as a slave because that's what got me in position 
for God to rescue all of our family, to rescue all of us. This is a part of a big, huge plan that God's been working on, and he did this. Even though I was a brat and you were mean, God used this for his glory. And David had mercy, showed mercy to his brothers. I wonder, do you think the Samaritan had ever been robbed? Maybe he had been robbed on that very same road. Do you think the Samaritan had ever felt the scorn of people who wouldn't touch him and just walk by? <laughs> All the time from Jews. And so maybe the very pain that the Samaritan had gone through in his life moved him to the, to the mercy, to the compassion that enabled him to be the best neighbor to this Jew who was laying there on the side of the road. So don't be afraid of your pain, folks. Let your pain be something that God uses to help develop mercy inside of you. So I've been uh, kind of looking at some of the responses to uh, Trump's diagnosis. <clears throat> In one article, it said, polling by the morning consult found that most Americans were surprised or worried after learning about the president's diagnosis. But concern over how Trump will fare differed for each group. An overwhelming amount of Republicans, 78%, were worried about the president himself, while almost half of Democrats said they were not concerned at all. Top emotions for each group also varied widely. Republicans reported being sad, while Democrats were indifferent or even happy. Yay, president, sick, COVID, it gets worse. Voters in California were similarly reticent in the face of the news and hesitant about what it meant for the election. I did not sleep well because of it. Murray, a member of the Republican Central Committee in Placer County told the LA Times, he said that if Joe Biden had tested positive, then he would feel awful for him as well. It's sad. I wouldn't wish that upon anybody. And seeing some of the comments, people laughing and mocking, there's an old man that just got COVID and you're putting up smiling emojis, referring to social media reactions that celebrated the president's positive test. Rosemary Duclo, a 64-year-old retired librarian from Roseville, isn't sure that Trump really tested positive. Mm -hmm. He always lies to us, Duclos said. His doctors always lie to us. There are a lot of good reasons for him to lie uh, to us about this. In fact, that theme kind of went on. He would get out of the debates. He might get a sympathy vote. <laughs> he could hide out in the bedroom for a while and have a miracle recovery and say it's hydroxychloroquine. <laughs> CNN chief White House correspondent Jim Acosta who has had a rather rocky relationship with President Trump, was actually mocked online for tweeting about President Trump not taking questions as he was boarding Marine One en route to Walter Reed Medical Center. And there's that's kind of a stark picture, isn't it? You know, no matter what your belief is, and, and, and several people, even on the you know, big, uh, opposing side to Trump, to President Trump, said, you know, it was, it was kind of hard to see and realize that the President of the United States was getting on a helicopter in order to be taken to the hospital. With a virus, that very easily could kill him. The New York Times, in its reporting of Trump's positive COVID-19 test, suggested the President should perhaps be taken off the, number th the November 3 election. <laughs> NBC, MSNBC host Joy Reid raised eyebrows on Friday for suggesting Trump was fabricating his diagnosis to get out of the debates. Oh dear. Schumer, Senator Schumer says, Trump coronavirus diagnosis shows what happens when you ignore science. Left-wing activist Michael Moore also floated a conspiracy theory that Trump could be lying about having coronavirus to change the conversation about this campaign as an opportunity to push for delaying, postponing the election. My thoughts and prayers, too, are with COVID-19. 
Moore tweeted Friday, which Concha said, in other words, that the president dies. Wow. The Washington Post journalist, beware. This White House can't be trusted to be truthful about Trump's health. Stephen Colbert, any of you watch him? <laughs> Comedian, actually did a special program on Friday night. Say what you will about the president, and I do, and he knows. This is a serious moment for our nation, and we all wish the president and the first lady of the United States a speedy and a full recovery, Colbert said. He noted that the Democratic nominee, Joe Biden, wished the Trumps a swift recovery. That's a classy response, Colbert said. But let's not forget, Biden needs Trump to get better. I mean, at the next debate, Joe can't interrupt himself. <laughs> Jimmy Kimmel, no reasonable person wants anyone to get this disease. But you can't look past the fact that over and over again, Trump has been making fun of Joe Biden for wearing a mask. He said this before showing a montage of clips with the president doing just that. <clears throat> I also wanted to make jokes about how Dr. Fauci is at the White House right now prescribing Trump bleach injections and bottles of I told you so. And then he got serious. If the president of the United States can get coronavirus, then what excuse do the rest of us random jerks have for not wearing a mask? This guy literally had people tested around him. He had the Secret Service blank slap anyone who even sneezed in his direction. Rachel Maddow, who has been uh, pretty brutal with President Trump. God bless the President and the First Lady Maddow, the MSNBC host and staunch critic of Trump wrote after the news broke. If you pray, Please pray for their speedy and complete recovery and for everyone infected everywhere. This virus is horrific and merciless. No one would wish its wrath on anyone. We must get it spread under control. Amen. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy.